All right. So, um, as many of you know, I'm Renderman, and uh, I have a distinct pleasure of moderating this uh, panel and introduction to microcontrollers. And I cannot believe that there, are, like, every seat seems to be filled here. Um, pretty crazy. So you probably the recognize. Is on. Uh, What's that? The pressure is on. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not wearing pants, so this just gets a lot more interesting. You flirt with your wife. And your crotch is right at the level of Joe's giant red fist. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me a moment. <laughs> it's going to be one of those kinds of panels, apparently. Yeah, you don't want to know what's going on behind this uh, this podium here. Um, so on my left, is that my left? Yes, that's my left. Um, we have firmwares. We have Lost, who everybody should know, and I have a personal grudge against for the number of years of torture from the Mystery Challenge. Oh, yeah. Um, all right, we got Smitty Halibut on the end here in his very epic hat and custom made vest. And Joe Grand, which. Uh, I'd like hello. to correct that render. That's TV's Joe Grand. Oh, TV's, TV's Joe, Grand. Joe Grand. Yeah, Discovery Channel. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Please, no applause, please. <laughs> So we're <laughs> basically here talking microcontrollers. Um, I'm like elated because I get to pick these guys' as brains for an hour here. That is something I would have like killed for at any other time. Um, so basically, uh, we're just going to go down and just sort of have everybody sort of introduce how they got into micros and uh, just sort of uh, their history. Um, and we'll go from there. So, firmware's? Wow. So, uh, you know, I started hacking code on an Altair 8800B. And uh, like a lot of you guys, I loved, uh, you know, writing software. But it's like I wanted to do hardware stuff. And so I ended up with, uh, oh, back in the day of 8051 microcontrollers. And, and that was all for fun. And ended up being an embedded systems engineer, uh, making my way up to being a VP of engineering for a contract design house. So I love making hardware that does something. And some of it has blown stuff up. And some of it has helped people live, so it's uh, probably a good balance. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a 50-50 thing there. Kind of a net zero. <laughs> yeah. So my first uh, foray into the world of microcontrollers was with the Motorola 68 HC11. Anybody in the audience remember that chip? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. We just dated ourselves, right? Yep. Yeah, the 80s called. They want their street cred back. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, I've just always been interested in how things work, not just electronics, but just things in general. Um, as a kid, I was always taking stuff apart and occasionally able to put it back together. Usually <laughs> things um, hacked to have different uh, functionality. I've had numerous jobs over the years. I've worked for Parallax. I've uh, worked as a design consultant for companies um, doing embedded systems and specifically embedded system security because that's kind of where my interests lie. So. And you have some experience with some badge design. A little. Not as much as bit. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Working on that. Me? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm Joe Grand. Um, TV's Joe Grand. <laughs> TV's Thank Joe you. Grand. So I. <laughs> <laughs> please, no applause, please. Um, yeah, so I, I got started with, with computers and electronics really early um, in 1982 with an Atari 400. And uh, my brother was luckily in, interested in this type of stuff. So he sort of threw all these tools at me and electronics and it didn't, didn't literally, literally hit me. Um, but uh, I kind of was exposed to a lot of electronics at an early age, which was cool. Um, so I first started getting involved in kind of non-microcontroller development. So making boards for you know red boxes and blue boxes and various phone freaking stuff. I think the statute of limitations is up. We can talk it's about It's probably that. up, yeah. yeah. Um, but I got involved in, in embedded development kind of in my teenage years and then in college. So I was sort of a Motorola uh, HC05, HC08 guy for a while and then got involved with microchip picks and sort of stayed with those. Motorola spun off into Freescale, so I, I, I went over and started using Freescale stuff. But if you guys noticed, the, uh, for, the, for DEF CON 14 badge was a microchip pick and then 15 through 18 was all Freescale. And that was mostly because they would just take me out to dinner more than Microchip did. Um, so yeah, the way to Joe Grant's heart is through his stomach. Free, free food, pretty much, guys. So re remember that. Um, yeah. So I sort of specialize in embedded system development of kind of low, low end consumer and household devices, and then of course I do hardware security. I break stuff once in a while too. Yeah. 
So interesting side note, Joe. Do you realize that some of the products that you would submit to Parallax for sale, that I was the one that was actually looking at them with, with uh, John Behrman? I know, and, yeah. And so Ryan that's was how, in control of my destiny. That's how kind of Joe and I met. And so like before we met through DEF CON, like, I was looking at his products. Um, and w- w- it, I think it was the GPS module. Probably the GPS. When we were before, having that before dealing with before GPS was easy to deal with. Yeah, and we were standing outside, and I think wasn't it was it John Williams that was busting your balls about something? I just remember oh, a funny awesome interaction yeah, that we had, and you were yeah. going. And you, I don't know. I think I think Ryan was at DEF CON, and I was at DEF CON, but I don't know if we knew each other. And it was like you work at Parallax, weird. But yeah, it's a small sort of like the embedded yeah. world is kind of a small community, yeah. I think. Yeah. And for the record, I do not work for Parallax anymore. No. So. So I think the the first question for everyone. What? Oh, oh, oh. And this guy over here. I'm good. Hey, Andrew, here, let me give you some water. Hold on, have some water. And the funny thing, the funny thing is, is, is Smitty is the one who put this whole thing together. <laughs> yeah, this whole panel was my idea. I'm not sure how I got uh, convinced these heavies to uh, to do this panel with me. Uh, my name is Mark Smith or Smitty. I um, I do. I'm the only one up here who does not do microcontrollers professionally. Um, and uh, so I, I am a hobbyist with my microcontrollers. I spend most of my time on Atmels these days. Um, Thank you for saying Atmel and not saying um, the other A word. <laughs> <laughs> what, I'm sure I'm sure it will come up. I'm, okay. I'm waiting for that. Um, I spend mo- oh the Arduino word. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so, okay. that will come up. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> ooh, good lord, we got a bad reception on that one. Um, <laughs> but I got my start in computers when I was at a very young age. My older sister got a TRS-80 Model One. Can any of you beat that? <laughs> yeah. Actually, no. I think the uh, 8800 beats that. Yeah. Um, so I started on that just doing basic. I didn't get into assembly until college in the early 90s. Um, my first microcontroller work was on an 80, 8051, but I didn't spend a lot of time in Intel because Intel assembly sucks. Um, <laughs> then, uh, like yeah, so, and, and I'm a hobbyist. I, I am a network engineer and, and system administrator by trade. And I just do this on, on the weekends for fun because I like making stuff and I like making things that work. And I've been into electronics for a long time. Um, and then once microcontrollers started getting really cheap in the 90s, that's when I, when I got into adding programmability to my projects. So. Okay. Yeah. So, but, and thanks for putting this panel together, by yeah, the way. Thank you. Yeah. Woo! Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? I didn't even show it. Oh, so, shit, you're welcome. <laughs> so, everyone um, who's not played with microcontrollers or is just starting like I am, initially it's, it's the question of where do you start? Because it is such a, a huge field and so many platforms, so many development tools out there. How the hell are you supposed to know where to begin? And I know some of you guys actually like teach classes on this. Um, where is a good place to, to kind of start and, and learn this? Should we just go down the line? Just, okay. Or just, let's just talk. Know. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think like, that's, a, that's definitely like people come up to me and ask the same thing. It's like there's so many different choices. And the, the good thing about nowadays is that there are so many choices, right? Mm-hmm. Like back in the day, if you wanted to get into microcontroller development, you had to get the individual microcontroller deal with the development environment, add a bunch of external stuff just to get the part up. The programmers, the yeah, platform, the programmer, everything. memory, everything else. And then you were writing like assembly, UV hoping that it was gonna work. Mm-hmm. So now it's like you have you know, Arduino platforms, you have propeller processor, you have all, you know, all these other modules, Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone and all of these things. And it sort of depends, I think, on what you wanna do with Absolutely. that yeah. device, right? Because there's, there's so many different flavors and so many different levels. If you're doing something basic, maybe use a basic stamp or if you're doing, or an Arduino. If you're doing something complicated, maybe do Raspberry Pi, which is Linux based. So now you can write all sorts of Linux stuff. So you don't even have yeah. to be a hardware guy. You can just write code and have stuff work on the hardware. On the, on the hardware. So yeah, it, it totally depends on what you're doing. And then you can always go to I, I agree. It depends on what you're doing. But for somebody who's new, it also depends on the tool chain for me. Yeah. Because yeah. I can't take a noob and drop them into certain tool chains that are like slamming your nuts in a door. Right. Like certain, yeah. <laughs> certain well, FPGA yeah. development uh, <clears throat> software packages, for lack of a better word, um, are not exactly user friendly. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of engineering tools suck anyway, right? So you just have to yeah, find yeah, the one they, that sucks definitely the, not the least. Holding. Yeah, yeah you, were, you, you mentioned the A word, but the one thing that I think Arduino has above uh, many of the other platforms is that it is meant for artists, not for engineers. Right. And so it, it, the, the thing that Arduino did that made it so popular is that they made everything so incredibly simple and, and trivial to use. You don't have to buy a programmer. The programmer's on the board itself. So the, the only problem I had with the Arduino and the Arduino zealots 
I don't have any problem with AVR. To be clear, I am not a zealot. Yeah. No, no, no. I get that. <laughs> but the thing that frustrates me is they talk as though it's the first time it's been done because there was a lot of money. Um, O'Reilly and the maker crowd started backing it. And you know you've got processing and you've got yeah. the environment, but they're not doing anything that like the basic stamp didn't basic do for the stamp, 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 yeah. yeah. So I mean I think really as far as go, going that route, the stamp was really the first chip to do that. Yeah, that's the, true. The problem that the stamp has had, and and I'm sorry, Parallax people who are out there, is they didn't, uh, they haven't grown with the way that the user space has grown, and they're still charging 50 bucks for a basic stamp too, and it's. It, it, you can't compete at that price point, and I actually have talked to, to Ken Gracie at Parallax. I was like, Ken, I love the basic stamp, I still do. And on a number of occasions, I've even heard Joe say, when I'm prototyping, I still grab for a basic stamp to do proof of concept stuff that's really simple things for off the shelf. But it's ridiculous to charge 50 bucks for that chip at this, these days. Yeah. And I said, if you're gonna if you're gonna stay competitive, at least as far as the stamp is concerned, you're gonna need to lower the price on it. So anyway, right. I thought that's, you know, I don't mean to be airing dirty laundry, but I think that's the kind of stuff you guys wanna hear, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, right. But I think the Arduino, you know, I mean, people always bash on it. And, you know, if there's like an Arduino hack on Hackaday, everyone's like, oh, Arduino lame. And it, it's sort of like there's definitely this religious war, right? Arduino versus other stuff, just like there was with open source, whatever, and Linux versus whatever. But, I mean, Arduino, for what it is, it's good. If, you're, if you want to get something done, there's lots of example code out there, there's lots of support from the community versus something like the basic stamp. You have some community support, but you have support directly from Parallax and the engineers and stuff. But the community support tends to be okay. My only problem with Arduino though is that a lot of the open source stuff that's out there, the modules that people write, Sucks. nobody's validating that stuff. You yeah. don't know if it's good. And it's sort of a paint by numbers kind of plug stuff together, which is great for prototyping, but once you're done, it's sort of like if it's a one-off project, that's fine. If you want to move it forward, that's when you have to really start going through and making sure that it, it's actually good. Yeah, but, but like, when, 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 with the subject, on the subject of how do you get started, though, yeah. you know, I would rather have somebody who is new to the hobby get an Arduino for 30 bucks, plug it in with a USB cable, Load up the Blink code, get it functioning, and go. That's fucking awesome. Okay, but look at the Blink code for an Arduino, and look at the Blink code for a BS2. I can oh. put my mom in front of the code for a Basic Stamp 2, and she can understand it. My mom does not do computers or the prop BOE, so. like Propeller Board of Education sure. stuff. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, so I'm not trying to, like I said, I'm not a zealot. I'm not trying to put the Arduino instead of the Basic Stamp stuff. I'm definitely not doing that, but. I, I, I want, so I guess we need to make two categories of the kind of the, the simpler consumer targeted yeah. microcontrollers yeah. versus the industrial, I work on this shit all day, I have the programmers and the, you know, I can write the, the um, and, and Smitty, oh, just, oh, just as a matter of confession, I've actually sold Arduinos at DEF CON before, we sold the Teensy one year, yeah. so I'm not like yeah. anti Arduino, yeah. what I'm anti uh, is the attitude of this is the holy grail that has come down from on high to save me from my uh, microcontroller ignorance. That's, <laughs> I, that's what I don't or the idea, agree with. Or the idea that, 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 it, uh, that anything else is way too difficult. Correct. I, yeah. I, I, you know, I don't know how many guys I've said, oh the Arduino is great because well I don't need an in-circuit programmer, well until the bootloader blows up and now you need, you know, and, and, and what's an in-circuit programmer? Well it's just another piece of hardware, you plug it in, you say program. It's not that hard for someone who's used to pushing packets around a network to learn how to use that. Dude, I mean, even TI's MSP430 tool chain is getting pretty good in terms of being usable. I mean, do you, what do you guys think about that? We yeah, but you can't have a beginner load up MSP430 and suddenly no, not, right? Like Arduino is a good platform sure, for that. Sure, yeah. One of these days we'll let Render ask another question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, I don't want this to be like me pleading questions. There's a microphone here. Um, we want to hear from you guys too. So yeah. if you've got. Get us to shut up. Ask us more questions. Otherwise we'll just yeah. keep here bitching all day. So. Yeah. Um, uh, one question I do want to yes, get to here. Walk up to the microphone. Oh, it's going to uh, be hard. Do you have to stage dive over to the microphone? <laughs> yeah. uh, one question I wanted to say was uh, one of the biggest difficulties I've had in getting into it is that you get the idea and you want to go and, and build it, but oh crap, now I've got to do a uh, DigiKey order, a uh, SparkFun order, something like that, and you got to wait you know, weeks because I'm up in Canada. Uh, you know, wait weeks well, that's your problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just cheap and don't want to pay FedEx. So one of the things I used to tell my students for getting started um, for saving money is you can usually get engineering samples from microchip a lot easier mm -hmm. than just about anywhere. And yeah, so, and, and that's yeah. the question is, you know, inevitably you, you end up with all these parts, bins, and everything like that, but the problem is, you know, sinking a, a huge amount of money into that. Is there, like, shortcuts or ways, like, 
with engineering samples to get yeah. that base stuff. Constantly so, harvest, sure. like a, yeah. pretend you're a squirrel yeah. and yeah. just start gathering stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, vendors will basically, if they think, if they, basically, if vendors think they're gonna make money, they'll give you free stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you, if they think you're doing something cool, they'll also give you free stuff, right? Because then it gives them, there's something they can promote and they can write about on Twitter or whatever. And to give a few samples out to a hobbyist isn't gonna kill them. It's only gonna help. So for the most part, you can get free stuff. But always scavenge, like I'm always, I live in San Francisco and there's kind of this weird kind of cycle of people put stuff on the street and then you can take stuff from the street and like put other stuff on the street. It's weird. Sometimes it makes <laughs> neighborhoods look really shitty, but, <laughs> but, but other times it's awesome, like if you can get there before the city comes to pick everything up. So I will always walk around and be like, oh, a printer. Like I wonder if there's EEPROMs in there I can use and just sort of scavenge and harvest. Yeah. And of course, going to like your local surplus stores and electronics flea markets, like you don't have to pay full price for things, yeah. but even if you do, most of the time full price is like pennies or a few dollars for stuff, unless you live in Canada. And make friends with engineers because uh, all of my engineers had desks that were filled with samples. That they were never going to use, oh, this part is so cool and I can call up the distributor and get it. You know, but it's scavenging parts, I mean, hell, that's how I learned how to solder. I didn't have any money for yeah. parts and you know, it's a lot harder these days with the surface mount stuff, but back in the through hole day, that's how, I, that's how I got parts. And in the worst case, Radio Shack. I know they had oh, had, I'm serious, I'm yeah. dead serious. They, they got a really bad reputation over Custom the last five or 10 years when they got rid of a lot of their electronic stuff. But they always kept that one little section where you could get resistors and capacitors and stuff. You know, it's, now it's like, Nine tenths of the store is selling cell phones, but they still have that one drawer of, yeah. of components. And it's like the last resort. It's the last resort. So at eight thirty at night, my DSL modem just died, and I have an exploded capacitor inside my DSL modem's power supply. I can still go down to Radio Shack and buy that thirty-five volt, six hundred and sixty hundred or six hundred and sixty microfarad capacitor to get my internet back online, so my wife can watch Game of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Radio Shack, and they're also getting into selling things. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I got a fan out here. Very good. They're also getting into selling microcontrollers like the A Word and Basic Stamp and um, a lot of modules and stuff. A lot of modules. But that's not too. a price. I totally like, didn't mean for you to start seeing the A Word instead of. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, yeah, they're, they're not the cheapest around. Yeah. But when you need it right bloody now, they're there. So I wanted to throw that out. No, well, the, the fact that they have the modules now, I mean, that, that's what hardware... That's, that's recent, and I love it. Well, hardware's come, you know, a, a full circle as a hobby. I mean, back when I got into it, we built kits and everything. You know, it was Heath kit and all that. Mm -hmm. and, and it died out with, when computers got big. Electronics nearly went away as a, as a hobby because, well, why do I want to do all this hard stuff and get ferric chloride all over my hands and etch boards when I can write code? And I can write code and compile and compile. Oh, it fucked up. Oh, okay, compile it again. Yeah. It, it didn't cost you anything. And, and it's actually moving more towards that with the advent of uh, FPGAs coming down in price now. Yeah. Because uh, now I can, you know, just Just imitate. recompile the hardware. Yeah. And now, now, you know, electronics well, is a hobby. It's, it's more of a systems level hobby where, yeah, some of us still build our own boards and so forth, yeah. but there's so many modules out there now. You really don't have to do that. That's true. It's like Legos. Yeah. All right, we had a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you do whenever you're up against a particularly crappy tool chain? What's your method of attack to get past that? Cry. A lot of Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I shoot things. I think, I think it depends. Like, I've had really crappy tool chains and I mean, sometimes you're stuck, right? If that's all that the vendor offers you, um, if I have a contact to the vendor, I'll talk to them and say, your tool chain sucks. You got to try to do something with it. But most of the time I'm spent dealing with a crappy tool chain and, you know, saving often and exiting and loading. <laughs> wow. And usually when I talk about crappy tool, ch tool chain, what I've sort of encountered is the tool will crash or it will disconnect from the debugger or something just annoying that you have to just re restart. And that's, I think, the nature of engineering tools because they're designed for Engineer. They're designed for engineers and they're not designed for the mass public so they don't go through the testing as like a normal piece of software would. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, they're just annoying and sometimes crappy, but as long as they end up compiling properly and working properly sometimes, <laughs> yeah. sort of like that's what you get. On the hardware side of that, I, I don't use KiCad anymore because they <laughs> pissed me off from crashing and losing my code too many times, my board designs. Yeah. I got another, got another a single Same guy. Clap. All right, thank you. I gotta buy you a beer afterwards. He, he jo Joe just claps at everything you say. Yeah, apparently, I got a fan. 
Joe, did, did you hear that uh, when I was doing this stuff for the badges this year, I actually used the free version of Eagle because I wanted everyone that was here to be able to recreate the badges with free software off the shelf. And I found an error in Eagle that says too many pixels in the Y direction. And yeah. it says it in German <laughs> on the bottom as well. And so I took the work and I rotated it to try and see if I could recreate the, the error in the other direction. And it, it doesn't exist in the other direction. <laughs> and, now, and, uh, and now everyone can just make their own black badges. Yeah. Uh, oh, but they don't have the clock. If, if, they, on it. Yeah, if they can do the mechanical watch movement and make that, <laughs> then they deserve a black. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. All right. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask you guys uh, what what do you think the best chip is for like uh, DSP kind of like audio oh, sorry, religious or war live Star audio yeah. processing yeah. Yeah. or DSP the best, audio maybe the best one to start with you know oh for DSP for DSP and audio stuff yeah. the one you already have live code audio for. processing. I, was it? I got nothing. The, the one you already have code for. I mean, you know, yeah. from a professional's viewpoint, right? Well, oh, this one's cheaper. Oh, this one's faster. Well, yeah, but how does that equate to, you know, a few hundred hours of engineering time? And if you've got code, if you can find code that does what you want to do as a project, you know, that whole question, where do I start? Well, find a, find a project that's similar to where you want to go. Or find a vendor that has the reference code or an application yeah. note for where you want to go. Yeah. Well, yeah. make really good friends with the FAEs. Yeah, the only experience I have with DSP stuff is the DEF CON 17 badge had a digital signal controller. So it was sort of a microcontroller that had internal peripherals but it also had DSP functionality. That's the only one I know of. That one was and cool. there was like actually, the tool is sort of cool. The tool set is not open source or anything but it's free. Um, and, and you can, which is to me fine, good enough. It's even better than open source if it's free. Uh, the, um, th there was one thing called the processor expert and you could actually select modules and say I want to do, you know, implement an FFT and you double click and there's a GUI and you can set it all up and that will configure all the DSP side of things uh, and you could do like a modem like some, you know, old school 1200 baud BPSK or whatever it was modem. So that's a good place to start but yeah, I'm sure there's a reference design somewhere or a project that wants to, that does something similar to what you want to do. That's uh, actually, I, d I do a lot of audio work, uh, audio electronic stuff as well as uh, digital. And that's generally where I'll start out. I'll look at the different chips and look for, uh, they'll have like the application note in there of, you know, this is a typical application for this chip. And I'll try and find one that matches closely what I'm trying to do. And that's generally how do I do you have to do that while standing right behind me? That just looks awful. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, like Render feels like he needs it to It sounds pee. like Render's peeing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, follow up, is there like a, a resource that I can go to to kind of like browse through all these different chip uh, examples? And Google. You just go Google. Is this thing called the internet? Uh, I mean, they're, they're all going to, each of the different vendors are going to have their own site and they're going to have their own list of things and they're going to talk about why their chip is, is awesome. They don't necessarily say better than the competitor because they don't want to acknowledge that the competitor exists, but they'll say, you know, we're awesome because we have all of these things. And you go to their competitor and they're going to say, we're awesome because we have all of these same things. And you would look at the list and they're like 95% overlap. And that's why, that's why you just see which one takes you out to dinner more. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Free food, always a plus. As far as searching for parts though, do you guys use Octopart a lot? Have you used Octopart? Yeah, Octopart's cool, but you have to sort of, that doesn't give you really lots of, it gives you data sheets, but it's not as easy as like a parametric search on a vendor site. Yeah, yeah. 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 Octopart basically will tell you the, which distributors have stock of the current part you're searching for and then give you data sheets. But if you search for DSP, you might see stuff. But you can also just go to DigiKey yeah. and do a search and then, you know, organize by price or by some feature Mauser's, and see which ones come up. Mauser's search in, uh, engine works much better than DigiKey's in my opinion. Yeah, so, so huh. Mauser's is much better. Other than, other than the big dogs, you know, DigiKey, Mauser, Jameco, and, you know, places like electronics, gold mine, and stuff like that. Are there any other major houses you guys order from? I, Jameco, oh, um, yeah. I use Digi DigiKey. Digi I use DigiKey primarily. Yeah, That's Digi well, DigiKey has first, they just started doing first class mail shipping too. Yeah. So you can pay like two bucks and oh, yeah. depending on where you live, get it within a day or two. Yeah, which they're is awesome. fast. Yeah, it doesn't work for me. The fun thing about DigiKey <laughs> was. You, you guys don't count. The fun thing about DigiKey for the longest time, for those of you who aren't, how many of you guys are familiar, you know DigiKey, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How many of you used to get their catalog sent to you and it's like that big yeah. ass phone oh. book? <laughs> and it was this. Yeah. And I complained and it got bigger and bigger. <laughs> and they used to come with stickers so that you could tag the pages. Yeah because there was so much shit in there. When they stopped <laughs> making those catalogs, I complained. I sent a message to them and said they should keep making them. Keep making them. I guess I'm against the trees or something, but I like having something <laughs> that I can like flip through and actually look. Like I really use that catalog. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's the only way to find connectors. I mean, chips are chips. Oh, but if you're going to find a connector. Try to find yeah. a connector on yeah. a damn parametric search. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Next question. So I'll out myself. I love my Arduino. Um, I'm sure most of the people here are here because they got started on Arduino. Show of hands. Yeah. Oh how yeah, good idea. Yeah. Who's used Arduino? Yeah. 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 How many okay. people's first Who's experience to using the A word? I will. All right. Not that many. <laughs> I how many Arduino. people here their first word. experience was like a, a basic stamp? Oh, that was my first. Experience. How many it was like pick? Cool. Wow. Yeah. I actually, actually really, really quickly, I want to interject this before you ask your question. Yes. My first experience with a pick was hacking your hex code from the DEF CON 14 badge. Yeah. I was the only one who successfully reprogrammed that goddamn badge, and I did not win the badge hack. I have a bone to pick with you. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to review the contest entries, and That's maybe right. I can yes, like, you will. give you an honor. Some asshole would like, put a, a modified <laughs> cigarette lighter behind it and made a flamethrower out of it one. <laughs> did he win? No, he didn't win I that know, one. It was the guy who had the audio. That was the pretty audio. cool, I admit. I'll have to review the notes. Sorry, go on. So, no, no, no. Um, so, you know, I, I've got an MSP... Uh, launch pad at home. I started off on an embed and 32 bit beefy. That thing is awesome. Um, but going back to the Arduino and just kind of back to the hobbyist artist thing, uh, SparkFun, Adafruit. Do They're you awesome. think? Yeah, definitely. Love, um, love SparkFun. Love oh, yeah. Good stuff. So the drop in hardware, the Lego kind of, I can drop it in, copy the code off from Adafruit, from SparkFun, yeah. you know, compile it, run it there. Do you think that's devaluing the industry at all? No, not always. No. 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 I, I love the, I'm oh, sorry. I mean, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I know the guys that's over at SparkFun. I love their stuff. I, uh, Ada's stuff shows up all the time. It's great. I think it's, it's, helping people that wouldn't be able to accomplish certain projects because it's making it Lego um, slap the pieces together. I mean, especially thinking like the lily pad with the folks that are doing the clothing yeah. packs and stuff like that. I think it's opened up that world to people who otherwise couldn't get through that barrier the same way the Arduino and the stamp both made the, both the pick and the AVRs accessible to people that weren't otherwise. Yeah. Okay, and if I can just interject a question on that, one of the the big things I've always found is you know just some of the, the tinkering with you know stuff to do in the goggles and that is okay. You've built it with you know a, a basic stamp or Arduino, whatever. It's taking it to that next step where okay, I no longer need all the yeah. Uh, yeah. accessories. I just need you know the chip and everything like that. My problem has always been where the hell do I figure out how to do that? Because it's like how do you, you know, are, scale? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you trying to make a product? Or are you trying to make stuff for you? Because that's two just a one off. Yeah, well, yeah, just one off stuff. Like a more refined. Yeah, thing. Um, you, you, you don't want to have a stack of shields. You're going to get it it You just want to have a single right, board right, right. of stuff that you yeah. need. Yeah, I think I I want to I want to answer that, but I want to say with you know this with respect to like Adafruit and SparkFun and all these places, it's it doesn't only help the people getting into it and it doesn't only help the hobbyists, it helps all of the professional engineers that don't want to go through the time of spinning a board to try a new part, Just right? So they're making footprints and breakout boards and all these things that saves a ton of time for everybody. Um, yeah, so it, it definitely doesn't hurt. And oh yeah, I mean, it's yeah. great for uh, prototyping as well. Yeah, you know, I want this. I want to have a, a you know this particular chip with the, with this controller and, and see if I can make this product work. I'm going to do it first with all these shields that are already built. Yeah. Slap it all together, make it work, and then say, okay, I've proved the concept. Now I'm going to go design and fab a board that has just these three components that I need instead of a stack of, of shields this tall. It is right. now a board this big, and that's what render. That's what you're asking, right? Yeah, how do you distill it? Step two. How do you distill it from all the crap down to only what you need. Yeah. Hey, Render, yeah. you, you hire me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't want to pay money, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, at that point you need to look at the schematics of every yeah. individual module. You have to see which pieces you're actually using. And then what I tend to do is, like, take all, you know, I have a big prototype of all the crap, and then I identify which parts are useful, create a smaller schematic, and then just get a, get a board layout package that, you know, whatever you're familiar with. Or if you're not, try to, you could use... Kicad or Dip Trace or Eagle or whatever. I use Altium Designer, but I'm a, I'm a fan yeah, of Altium. That's myself. more expensive, and they had there's a free version of that. There may, may not version. be torrents of Altium, and so, then you can go spin your board. Use o eight o s h park dot com to get your yeah. boards fab. You can it's like a dollar a square inch or something, yeah. and experiment. And because it's so cheap, if you if you fuck up the board fab, you just do it again. And you yeah. wait a few more days, you get another one back. Yeah. Yeah. Am I going to get kicked off the panel if I admit that I use Express PCB? No, not at all. Okay, fact, good. I, I know a lot of people that for prototyping purposes. Um, but there are some oh, yeah. 
not released. So the way PCB Express and, the, and a lot of those guys work is they'll release their own proprietary design software, but then they don't give you the actual Gerbers. They create yep. the Gerbers in house, and that's how they kind of lock you into using them as their service. I know of, of at least two different groups that were writing stuff to take the stuff that their software produced and actually give you your, nice. your real Gerbers. Sweet. Nice. So it's um, like a jailbreak. Yeah, jailbreak it's, it's like jailbreaking the design process. But Express PCB is a great service because yeah. you you can, they have their own software that is not nearly as complex as Eagle or KiCad or anything else. It is so incredibly dead simple to use to do circuit board layout. They can do two layer boards, four layer boards. They can do a silk screen on the top, not on the bottom, unfortunately. Um, but and then once you have the design, if you can keep your board to two and a half inches by three point eight inches, then you click a button and give them, I think it's, it's up to about a little less than 60 bucks right now if you don't need a solder mask, or I think 70 or 80 bucks if you want a solder mask and, and silk screen, for three boards, and they will get them to you in about a week. Uh, so it's an incredibly cheap way of prototyping. I mean, you know, two and a half by 3.8 is not a tiny board. It's not huge, but it, it's, you, can, you can fit a lot on, the, on that amount of space. And it's a great way of just getting in and like I'm going to draw traces from here and kind of connect these pins and you don't have to worry too much about making it nice and clean because you're not making a product. It's just a prototype. And the service is great. I've never had a problem with them. And it's really inexpensive. Osh Park is also a great way of doing it expensive, but I think they have a much longer lead time at this point. I think it, no, I think he runs boards now like every other day or something. Does he really? Yeah. And I think that one, you know, laying out boards is a completely different discussion, but for the most part, if you're doing a prototype and it's not something that has specific board layout requirements, you can get away with oh, yeah. a, simple, a simple tool. I do want to mention too for you Canadians out there, <laughs> there's um, AP Circuits. Is, yeah. Right? AP Circuits, eh? Yeah. Someone's like, yeah. So you can use AP Circuits, Alberta printed circuits. You're and it's a similar me. type of, you know, uh, prototype quantity, simple board fab type of, type of house. They're expensive, but they're fat. Thanks, but, and they're, but they're Canadian. Yeah. But they're so Canadian. They're cracked yeah. on shipping. Uh, I, they, they ship to the U.S. He's apparently they that ship too. to the U.S. too. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Sure. I'm not afraid to ask dumb questions. <laughs> We're not afraid to answer them. Oh, excellent. Um, I bought two boards literally like a week ago, little development boards. One was the BeagleBone. Okay. And the other was, I think I just went to YouTube and searched on embedded programming and found some guy, statemachine.com, I think, who did a, a nine series lecture on using the TI uh, Stellaris Launchpad, walking you through like writing a C program to blink the LEDs and that sort of thing. Um, I guess the first question is, are those are those microcontrollers or are those sort of bigger than, than so the Beagle board is a great board. Uh, I, I like the Beagle board stuff. Um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on I, those. I would consider those. I would consider those modules, right? I mean, there's microcontrollers on them. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, they're, they're, the, the, the distinction that I think he's trying to make is that they're not microcontrollers; they're CPUs. I mean, right. it, it, so yeah. th there's a very subtle distinction between a microcontroller where you are writing assembly yeah, like, or C yeah, or something I mean, that's running directly on the chip a timer. What's that? Well, the, the uh, uh, Intel considered, yes, there was an 80186. They considered it a microcontroller because it had timer on board. Because it had timer uh, on board. I always thought it, it didn't was. Didn't have ADD, the, you know. I always thought a microcontroller had onboard peripherals, so memory and things like that on board. You don't have exposed bus, yeah. you know, buses going outside stuff. But then a microprocessor was just the CPU where you needed to have everything external in your memory mapping and your you know, address and data bus switching yeah, and all that. That's how I always talk about it. But when you're talking about things like the BeagleBone and the Raspberry Pi, the, the main difference there is that you are not necessarily writing code that has 100% control over the CPU. You are writing an application that runs inside an operating system. And so it, it's a different in development environment. And, I, and I'm not trying to make a religious distinction here. It, it, they both have their place. You know, if you're a software guy and, and you don't need to worry about, you don't want to have to worry about how to write a bootloader and you just want to have something that does some, you know, stuff and you're comfortable with GCC and you can, you write applications in Linux all day, then put Linux on your chip or put Linux on your uh, embedded environment and that's fine. It's gotten cheap enough that, you know, Dr. Moore solved that problem for us, right? The reason we had microcontrollers is because they were smaller and simpler and cheaper when a full CPU was so much more expensive. That is no longer the case. We can th now throw transistors at these things and it is, the cost is no, no longer the problem. So we can put an entire Linux operating system on this thing and it's still 35 bucks. An Arduino costs about 30 to 35 bucks depending on where you buy it, sometimes cheaper. The Raspberry Pi is 35 bucks. 
What's the difference? Well, the Raspberry Pi has a shit ton more resources, but it also needs it because it's running a full operating system. All right, so it's no longer a matter of which one is better because they both have their place. It's really a matter of which one suits your application better. So the answer to the question of which one is better depends on what you're trying to do. And a lot of that comes down to like high performance timing and things like that. Yeah. I need, if I need to get down to the hardware level on something like uh, that's when it becomes more important to be able to get down to that level and have a tighter yeah. control. Yeah, yeah. most of you guys don't say interrupt latency probably as much as we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so would you rather write a custom application that just runs natively on the hardware then as opposed to writing a device driver for it Linux? It depends on what it, I'm doing. It depends on, yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends on the application. It depends on what you're trying to do with it. I mean, you know, think about robot. Do you really want an OS controlling your motors on a robot? Or do you want something that's very simple, very predictable, uh, where you know exactly, you know, what you can do to take control of it. Oh, I'm not waiting on, you know, this to message that and for the OS to decide to come around and then turn the robot off before it drives off the cliff. You well, know? if you have, that's but at the same time, if you have an R, if you have like a good deterministic RTOS or something, that's fine for embedded. It's not like you're running, win I mean, you could run Windows on an embedded device. Oh, I wouldn't. Right. But I got friends at Willow Garage who would <laughs> shoot you for that. <laughs> and the normally you would just have, yeah. normally you would just have a simple state machine depending on the product, right? It all depends yeah. on what yeah, you want. Yeah, I'm surprised yeah. nobody brought VXWorks. So the before experts. now, yep. yeah. So, uh, like in the robot yeah, example, I would, I would, I would, I would put the motor controls on a microcontroller, but then I would use a something like a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone to maybe do the route processing and the uh, um, you know the high level decision making process and taking in of video stream data and, and doing an analysis of what's going on around me. But then have it send a signal to the microcontroller and say, you know, turn my wheels on going this speed for this long, and then have the microcontroller that has the very precise timing actually control the motors. So that's the kind of decision making process that you have to make at design time of what is it that I'm trying to do and which of these platforms is better for that particular task. Yeah, and, and, and it was just briefly mentioned here, the, the dreaded word that nobody likes to just deal with is uh, dealing with interrupts and interrupt timing. And I think that's why we're now breaking into this point where we've got even my, what I would call a microcontroller with multiple cores and things like that, like the propeller. Propeller. Yeah. Um, is because of, you then you don't have to deal with time slicing and interrupt problems and loop timing and things like that. And I think we're starting, and even further than that, I think the real future for all this is going to be uh, what we see coming from the FPGA world. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. Hi, uh, I'm really happy to see all the embedded stalwarts here experience, and I'm uh, I thank Smitty for putting up this panel. Really, uh, my question to you is: uh, I'm an embedded system student, uh, student, and being a, uh, I want to be in this field for pro professionally, like you know, not a hobbyist, but professionally. So. Uh, Earlier, it was like uh, if you do, if you in microcontrollers, you should know sensor interface, you should know in, uh, you should know actuator interface, and you should know basic control logic design. That was the basic thing in my stereotype in my mind. But now the the time has changed a lot. That the, the programming part, the control logic part, has evolved and it's reached to such high level that you can do software systems, you can do database systems, you can do network systems, you can do controls. You know, like all the systems. So. Uh, PCB designing and schematics and you know sensor is still there, actuator is still there. My question to you all is like as a base, uh, as embedded systems engineer, what are the basic things which at least I should know firmly? firmly? I hope I'm clear. I, I guess you're, you're just asking what is a basic skill set to enter into that world as a professional? Um, is that correct? Yeah, the basic skill set, yeah. yeah. And what uh, later on I can decide on my own like where I'm interested in. Like, so. um, well, uh, well, I'm not the professional. You guys. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I'm never professional. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. I almost feel like that's asking how do you become a hacker? Yeah. Like, so, I mean, to me, it's just a natural progression of hobbyists, you know, building stuff, and then it's like, oh, wait. Yeah, helping out of the company, and then it's like, wait a second, now they want to hire me, and it's like they're paying me to just do this stuff. So I think a lot of it is once you get. Once you get your foot in the door, like if you, you know, you already you already named off a lot of the things that are yeah. important. Once you find a company or a project that you're in love with, you just start doing it, and you will just kind of gain stuff. And I don't really know, you know, what the best thing to know, um, but especially if you get into a company, the, the hands-on, the, the real-world experience that you get from working at like an actual company that works with embedded systems, whether it's a, a product development company or whether it's a specific product 
you know, not consulting, whatever it is, that's where you get the best experience. And, and so I think as long as you kind of, you know, love what you do and, and, and you learn more about all those things you already said, it's just kind of a, this natural thing. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if there's any better way to explain it. And I, and I, I know I've been giving this answer a lot, but I think it also depends on what the application is that you're trying to do. So uh, what kinds of general skill sets? Well, obviously electronics. Uh, if you're going to be doing microcontrollers as well, then some programming would probably be good. Uh, the lower level, the better. Uh, understanding of how assembly works is going to be important. Uh, I would second that. You know, here, here's the big difference. I mean, I, uh, between embedded guys and, you know, pure software. Uh, speaking as a hiring manager, and okay, here's a skill set that I would list if I was doing, you know, the, the official thing, and then I'll tell you what kinds of people I really hire. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> big difference, physics. Because, okay, you're, you're going to be turning motors and interfacing with sensors and talking with people about, you know, uh, you know, oh, what, what this frequency of whatever, or this coming in, and I need to turn it into, you know, this real world thing, and I'm going to turn it into software somewhere. So understanding the physics behind that is far more important than, you know, again pushing packets around. Uh, when it comes down to hiring people, shit, you know, I had this one kid, and we were interviewing him, and went through, and you know, well, what did you do last summer? Oh, I, I rebuilt this this uh, Chevy 350 just to just to understand it. Shit, you're hired because I want somebody that does hands on. I mean, in, in the embedded world, you've got to touch the hardware. Yeah, you know. The, the one big question, have you ever brought up a new system? Okay. You know, because, and, and that, again, it goes back to what I said earlier about you know, doing hardware. Okay. If your code doesn't work, okay, you, you just recompile. You got, a, you got a board. You spend all this money. You decide, okay, you're going to take this down. You're going to put it into one board. You've, got, you've laid the board down. You put all your parts on there, which is a fucked up mistake. But you've got this board and you turn it on and it doesn't work. Okay. Now what? You know, yeah. and and it, you've got to understand what's going on on that board, and it could be it could be something like again physics. It could be you light it out wrong, and it ain't going to work. It could be the chip's not running, a trace was left off. Hands on. Yeah, just being, make, able, yeah, being able to stuff. yeah make being stuff. able to <laughs> being able to troubleshoot uh, circuits okay. is a huge skill that, and like when I was teaching at the university. Um, it used to frustrate me to no end. Like I, I would, I was brutally honest with some students. I'd be like, if if they come to me and ask a question, and I would always say, Have you tried it? Have you gone out and tinkers? We need more tinkers. And if they hadn't tried it, you don't have the mindset to be doing this type of work. And to be blunt, you know, we need more tinkers. And I know, I know, it's right now we call them makers, but we need more tinkers. We need people that are putting their hands on stuff. I, I'm, I'm always championing in the embedded systems world. We teach kids from a young age that electronics are expensive, dangerous, and breakable. Not, and so, not anymore. Not yeah, with but the, Exactly. But you yeah. know, in our community, but for the longest time, I mean, everybody, I mean, just even look at the participation in the badge stuff here at DEF CON. We have orders of magnitude more people involved in badge stuff if it's not electronic because people are just have that intimidation factor that haven't made that first step. That's why we have the hardware hacking village. That's why DEF CON Kids is doing the electronic electronic badges this year. And we need to continue to propagate and, and, and keep that momentum moving forward. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Thank you. Just one thing, uh, one more thing. Uh, when we were discussing about uh, for getting started for a beginner, uh, we were discussing about Arduino or basic STEM or uh, the thing which I wanted to know is like, I, when I use Arduino, I have used Arduino. I've used, I've, I've get works, I've got the things done. But uh, by doing it, by you know using it more and more, getting deeper into it, will it give me that basic concept of you know like uh, which evolves, which makes me evolve as engineer? That you know, if I get any new program, any new, any new microcontroller in future. I'll be able to program it. I'll be hook up, a, able to hook up a programmer into it, or something like that. I'm looking for something to get started in that way, you know, like which makes me able to later on work on any microcontroller and not just Arduino or pick one. Uh, I mean, they're all different in little ways, and they're all the same in many ways. So um, just pick one and get started, and then learn it and get comfortable with it, and then pick another one and get started. You know, maybe you start with a propeller and learn spin. It's spin's assembly is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Um, I, I don't know if yeah. you were involved in spin at all. I'm sorry, uh, spin is the non. <laughs> Uh, spin is the spin is the high level. Spin the high level. Yeah, I'm sorry. The propeller assembly is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I don't know if you were involved in that at all. 
lost, but it, uh, it is a great assembly. Uh, and then you take that and then you maybe pick up an Arduino and then you maybe pick up a, uh, uh, an Atmel programmer and just start working on that or maybe Freescale or something like that. But just pick one and get started. I would be willing to I, bet that all of us up here have a closet full of dev kits and programmers for yep. different environments. Yeah. Do you yep. uh, I have a barn full of that yeah. shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, it, I think one, you know, one advantage of Arduino, I, I think the question was going from sort of like renders of going from one to you know the module down you want to start working with more at a lower level and that one thing with Arduino is that and you see this a lot is because Arduino really is just the code that's running on the Atmel AVR. On the AVR. Right? So you yeah. can start with the Arduino platform board and then if you want to like try to refine that or go a level down then you can just take an Atmel AVR and port or load Arduino or software on it and that you know use that so it's slightly more refined. And then eventually, but eventually you're going to want to get to the point where you have a microcontroller, or maybe you, maybe you don't need to get to that point, but you'll have a microcontroller with just the stuff you want, and it's not a module, but it's a refined product that's just stuff you want. You can actually go the other way. I mean, for those of you who are running the Darknet game this year, um, the Darknet badges, the software was written in the Arduino IDE, even though it is not an Arduino itself. Uh, the Arduino IDE is just a way, it's just a front for GCC, AVR GCC. Uh, so it takes C++ code and turns it into Atmel code. Um, and if you give it the right hardware files, you can find them online for the ATtiny85, then you can use the Arduino IDE just because it is so incredibly simple and program non-Arduino devices. By the way, if you haven't talked to the Darknet guys, they did awesome work this year and it's an yeah. amazing contest. You Thank should you. Good to go awesome. talk to them. So. Thank so you very we much. got five minutes left and I want to bang through as many questions as we can here. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Come on up, noise. Speed, speed round. Hi. Speed round. Hey. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I started on the propeller and I'm still on the propeller because I'm pretty addicted. Um, so I've built a whole bunch of stuff and they're all, they're all unique, they're all completely digital circuits. But I have a problem on, on one of my boards specifically where when I run it at 3.3 volts, I get data corruption on my UARTs, but when I drop it down to 2.8, everything works. So how would you go about starting to debug something like that? Can you drop it, it works? Yeah, it's bizarre. That's drop fucked up. I don't know. I, I mean, the first <laughs> thing I would say is look at, the, I know, just, look, look at the signals on the scope and see if you're actually getting scope. noise outside of the chip or if it's something that's being caused by over voltage or something else inside the chip. And then check, you know, it, it make sure it's noise versus parity issues. You know, maybe there's just some other weird configuration thing. Yeah. It has an RF module on it, so noise, I guess, is possible. You think? So. Yeah. Even something, <laughs> even Baby something as strange as battery physics. placement. Yeah. I, that he goes back to exactly what, it, what he was saying. You know, welcome to the world of now of hacking your circuit or troubleshooting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really one of the greatest skills that I think some people are. As soon as you start talking about RF, that uh, the, Ryan was mentioning earlier, one of the things you should learn, phys or excuse me, it was firmware, it was firmware. is physics. Yeah. You know, I bet you you have a trace somewhere that is exactly the length of your RF, your, you know, a quarter wave, wave length, yeah. your quarter wave length yeah. trace somewhere that's just picking it up. I mean, yeah, but, and you'll be able to visualize that on the scope and then you'll yeah, know where to start. Yeah. You, you, you got to have a scope. Out. I mean, uh, you know, try, trying to troubleshoot a board without, uh, without a scope is no. like trying to tr troubleshoot code without a debugger. I mean, yeah. you, you, it, it happens it. all the time. Yeah, there are startups that I've seen in San Francisco that kids have, you know, dropped out of school and moved to California to start companies. And they don't even have an oscilloscope to debug the most basic yeah. things, and it's mind blowing. Go get your old Tech 465. Get really rocking. Yeah, I get brought a logic go. analyzer with me, but that ain't gonna help me. Thank you. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. Oh, that, that was an, that's old school, old okay. 465. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, one question for one person up here. We'll just kind of keep the discussion going, and uh, there's. Oh. Nice. Okay, what, what's with the porn music? Is that all porn music? I think that's, that's I'm done with it. Are we done? Are we done? I guess I, I don't know. Is, is that the is that, that the get off stage music? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I got nice. Dance party, everybody. Keep going. One one person, one question. We have four more people. Go for it. Or, or Joe, just do lightning round. Just go. Quickly. Um, yeah. When you're making a decision designing, like uh, I would say, an RF signal processing board. Which point are you drawing the line between saying I'm going to use a DSP or an FPGA for the solution? Not me. <laughs> I would I would lean oh I would lean towards a DSP just because FPGAs when I think of FPGAs I think of just the hardcore digital side of things and DSP might just give you more I don't know maybe easier to kind of manipulate 
if that makes sense, you could always maybe port to FPGA, but I would tend to go with the DSP first. Next question. Thanks. What can I do to help my uh, young children? I've got an 11 year old boy who's coming of age. What can I do to introduce them to this world? Um, I don't have a lot of experience. Go get either, the What's a Microcontroller Kit. What? The What's a Microcontroller Kit. Get okay. it at Radio Shack. What he said. From, okay. from, from Parallax. It's a Parallax What's a Microcontroller Kit. It comes kit. with a huge book that was written to help move you forward, and that's the difference between that product and any of the others, is the supporting documentation is a no kidding book. Can you give so, me a free sample? Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't work for Parallax anymore. Uh, I don't work for Parallax anymore, but I still think it's a great way to introduce people to it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay, I got a long list under my palm. Oh, but, Jesus. But very quickly, the two things I'd say, I, and I'm a systems engineer, I do mission critical embedded systems. Awesome. And I got started when I was 10 doing basic on a G time sharing system and then cut, did 8080 in 76. So I'm an old fart. <laughs> the two things I'd say is no, the, t the tool chain, the Atmel and the, um, the Arduino gives you a solid, reliable tool chain. Stay away from the CCS compiler. It should be chucked into the heart of the sun. I lost 60 hours of my life on a professional project because of the friggin' CCS yeah. compiler on a PIC-24. The other thing I'd say, I haven't heard about table for learn, one. learn C. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I second that. And keep yeah. your code simple. Yes. I would Don't say learn, learn C, learn C, and then learn assembly. And to be fair, the CCS compiler is good for certain things. I found bugs in that compiler, too, but then when you do, you get free subscription for Sorry. longer. The ninjas are getting restless here. I think they just start throwing spears at us, so we got to wrap it up. Here. I, I want to make one comment to that. I tell everyone that's just a programmer, do some embedded system stuff. It will change the way you program. Oh yeah. yeah. So it's a risk. You live in a what the fuck the machine's doing. All right. All right. Thank oh, you very much. Oh man, this one's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.